you have a Bible, we're in John chapter 12. We're continuing our study in the Gospel of John. Stop all this mirth. You people love each other too much. It's enough. <laughs> exactly. Uh, maybe we should just let it ride. I think we should let it ride. I would love to keep doing this, but the hamburgers are going to get cold at Teresa and Randy's if we take too long. And the potato salad will get warm and all those things. So we're going to dive into the word here. So John chapter 12, verses 20 to 36. The hour has come. The title of today's message. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship in the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, verse 23, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Verse 27, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Verse 34, the crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? They still don't get it. Verse 35, then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Lord, thank you for your word today. Help me not to get in your way. Speak to us the things that we each need to hear. Whatever foolish things come out of my mouth, Father, Take them, rearrange them into what needs to be heard in the heart of each one here. The power of your Spirit is in this room. The power of your Spirit is in your Word. Help us not to miss it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we're heading for, yay, another time change in just a few weeks on November 6th. <laughs> Consider the difference that that one hour makes. When it's time to spring forward, that single hour of stolen sleep feels like torture. Can I get a witness? But when it is time to fall back, that one hour, that one single hour means a long, guilt-free snooze session in the morning, doesn't it? One hour. One hour makes a big difference, doesn't it? One hour, just as one hour can bring suffering, another hour might bring rejoicing. But it is possible, or is it possible, I should ask, is it possible that one single hour might signify both suffering and rejoicing at the same time? In today's passage, Jesus says that his hour has finally come. This is after several occasions in John's Gospel, if you'll remember, when Jesus has made it clear that 
his hour had not yet come at those various times. When his mother asks him to help with the wine at the wedding in Cana, Jesus says, what? My hour has not yet come. And then he makes the wine anyway. He must have been talking about a different hour. He was talking about this hour. When Jesus is teaching in the temple courts and the leaders try to capture him, he eludes them. He slips through their hands because, as John says, his hour had not yet come. But today, Jesus says, my hour has come. The hour has arrived. His hour has come. It's a strange passage because Jesus doesn't directly answer any one of the questions brought before him. I don't know if you noticed that. He doesn't directly answer any of the questions brought before him, almost as though he has a different agenda than we do. <laughs> Yet he answers every question we should be asking. The Greeks in this story at the very beginning, who represent the Gentile world, the outsiders, they ask to see Jesus, which, is, which serves as a signal that this is it. The time is here. The hour has when the Gentiles come to see Jesus, Jesus says, that's my cue. My hour has come. Rather than jump on the opportunity to expand his ministry by entering into new Greek and Gentile territory and markets, Jesus rejects worldwide fame as it comes calling at his doorstep and instead chooses the way of the cross. Jesus is not rejecting the notion that he is here not only for the Jews, but for the Greeks and Gentiles as well. He's not saying that he's not here for those Greeks and Gentiles. By walking away from momentary fame that day, he was rejecting the world's way of doing things and opting instead to do things the Lord's way, God's way. Yet, Yes, God would draw all nations, even Gentiles, to his love, but it had to happen a certain way. The hour of Jesus was not to be 15 elusive minutes of fame, but an hour of suffering and shame through which an eternity of rejoicing would be made freely available to all. He rejected the temporary glitz of worldly fame in favor of opening a permanent portal to heaven's glory. More on how that works in a moment. But the key to understanding the significance of this hour is found in verses 31 and 32 this morning. This is what Jesus says in those verses. He says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people unto myself. This is the hour of judgment. It is the hour of of driving out. It is the hour of being lifted up, and it is the hour of drawing all people to himself. The hour of judgment. First, Jesus says, now is the time for the judgment on this world. By this, he means that the hour of the cross is the hour of judgment on sin. That's what he's talking about. Both the curse of Adam's original sin, as well as the sins that we personally commit each and every day. Commentator Craig Keener observed this. He said, The guilt of the ages cannot be swept under the carpet, but must be drawn out into the light and judged. Sin can't be swept under the carpet. God's not going to sweep sin under the carpet. It has to be drawn out into the light and judged. Wrongs have to be made right because God is a just God. What is broken must be fixed because God is a healer. Someone must pay for the debts that we've incurred with God and with one another. And yet our sin and the sin of the world is too vast for any of us to compensate for. There is no earthly way to repay a heavenly debt. I'll say that again. There is no earthly way to repay a heavenly debt. Only heaven can do that. And so the hour of the cross was not optional. It was inevitable. It was inevitable. The moment Adam sinned and deliberately disobeyed God, the hour of the cross became a necessity 
the countdown began, an unavoidable event that would wield the force necessary to redeem such a catastrophe as sin. And so at the hour appointed by the Father, Jesus was executed in my place. He was executed in your place. He was executed in our place. We are not without responsibility for our sins. But we are no longer condemned by them in Christ. We are no longer condemned by our sins. The wrath of God, just, fair, right, accurate, and true, has been satisfied. It has been paid in full. Amen, amen, and amen, and amen. O oh, sinner, we must always run to the cross when we feel discouraged or when we're anxious over our past or present sins. For though we are guilty as charged, we can't deny the charges. Our death sentence has already been carried out, not commuted, but carried out. E. A. Carson writes this, The world thought it was passing judgment on Jesus in the cross. The world thought it was judging Jesus in the cross. In reality, the cross was passing judgment on the world. This hour of judgment for which Jesus came. This hour of judgment for which Jesus came into the world is at the same time fearsome in its fury and awesome in its redemptive power. You have been redeemed. You have been redeemed. There's a great Bible verse that says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Have you heard that verse? You should memorize that verse. There is therefore now no condemnation for you. I want you to say this with me because I know we all struggle with this. There is no condemnation for me. Say it again. There is no condemnation for me. One more time, there is no condemnation for me because you are in Christ Jesus. Hold on to that truth because the hour of judgment came. The hour of judgment was in our favor. Now, the hour of judgment is one thing, but now the hour of the cross was not limited to judging sin. It was also the hour of judgment on the devil. Jesus says, now the prince of this world will be driven out. Now the prince of this world, this hour, the prince of this world will be driven out. The hour of the cross is the hour of driving. It's the hour of driving out the devil. Carson writes this again, although the cross might seem like Satan's triumph, it is in fact his defeat. It is his defeat. In Revelation 12, 9 through 10, we read of this judgment against the prince of the world. It says this, The great dragon, Satan, was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now, this hour, have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. That's Jesus. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, the one who accuses you and me, who loves to whisper in our ears, who loves to bring us shame, who loves to tell us we're doing it wrong, who loves to tear us down while God's trying to build us up. The accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Amen. This hour of driving out is not merely the temporary withdrawal of a demon through an exorcism or the shuffling of the devil forces, devil's forces from one tormented soul into somewhere else like a herd of pigs. That's not what this is about. This hour of driving out spells the full and final defeat of Satan and his irrevocable and the irrevocable disabling of his stronghold on earth. Every tank of his is blown up. Skirmishes will continue. They continue to this day, just as they do in any war once the capital has been taken. But the devil's footing to condemn us and to condemn you has been forever lost. There is no condemnation for me. There is no condemnation for me. Say it again, there is no condemnation for 
for me because of this hour. Because of this hour. The secret weapon, the doomsday device that obliterated the gates of hell was detonated at the hour of the cross. Once the wrath of the righteous father was satisfied by the death of his innocent son, the sacrifice of the lamb rendered inoperable the devil's weapons of guilt and the weapons of shame. And there is now no longer any basis for the devil's charges against you. No longer any basis for his charges against us. The hour of the cross is why we who call on the name of Jesus no longer need to live in fear. When the devil rushes hard against us, we may simply point to the cross and tell him to go back to, well, from whence he came. The hour of the cross. This bread and this cup. Body and blood is our shield and our fortress. The helmet which guards our hearts and minds when we are racked by guilt, driven to shame and overcome by anxiety and regret. By taking upon himself the full measure of God's right judgment of the world, Jesus has once and for all foiled the devil's only possible gambit against us. The only thing he can do to you is whisper in your ear. And God has blunted that weapon through the cross. There is no condemnation for me. Say it with me. There is no condemnation for me. The cross makes every child of God invincible in the face of his lies. Satan, Satan's attempts to destroy Jesus only serve to destroy himself. The hour of the cross is the hour of driving. The hour of judgment, the hour of driving. And it's also the hour of lifting. Next, Jesus says that the hour of the cross is the hour when he will be lifted up. Not only is it an hour of judgment on sin and an hour of driving out the devil, but the cross is also an hour of lifting Jesus up. For those who know how the story ends, this phrase, when I am lifted up from the earth, packs a double wallop. On one level, lifted up refers to the cross, when his body would be physically lifted off the ground, hung by nails in a wooden beam. Lifted up, set on a post, for all to see and mock and spit at. But on another level, lifted up refers to the glory awaiting him after the cross, when he will be raised from the dead. In this specific phrase, when I am lifted up, Jesus presents us with a carefully crafted double entendre. On the one hand, it conveys the gruesome significance of his humiliating death. And on the other hand, it expresses the awesome glory of the resurrection. That phrase, lifted up, represents both suffering and glory. Is it possible that one single hour might signify both suffering and glory at the same time? The infinite wisdom of God is revealed in this mystery. The way of suffering is the way of glory. The way of suffering is the way of glory. A seed must be buried before it can flourish. You and I must be buried before we can flourish. It doesn't matter how much you think you got it all together, you don't. I don't. There are parts of each and every one of us. I don't care how long you've been walking with Jesus. I don't know if you know I don't care if you know every song and every scripture. There's something in each of us that has to die. Each day. A seed must be buried before it can flourish. Isaiah 52, 13. It's the story of the suffering servant and the glory of that servant. Isaiah says this, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Hebrews 1, 3 says this, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Not a carbon copy. He is the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Most of us spend our lives avoiding suffering. We spend our lives avoiding suffering. 
We think the cost of living sacrificially is too great. It's not fun to die. And yet Jesus says the only way to truly live is to let go of our lives. Only when we release our death grip on the world can we fall into the life grip of heaven. If we aren't willing to sacrifice the way Jesus did, we will have no part in being raised the way he was. The paradox of the way of Jesus is that in order to live, we must first die. To gain everything that matters, we must let go of everything that does not matter. To win heaven, we must be willing to lose earth before we can be lifted up in resurrection power. We must first be humbled by the process of taking up our cross each day. The hour of lifting up has come, not only for Jesus, but for us as well. One more hour, the hour of drawing. The hour of drawing. The hour of the cross is the hour of judgment, the hour of driving, and the hour of lifting. Finally, though, the hour of the cross is also the hour of drawing. Jesus said, I will draw all people to myself. For those of us who were just a little worried about the Greeks' unrequited request at the beginning of this passage, Jesus gives his answer here. He says that the hour of the cross is also the hour when he will draw all people, including Greeks and Gentiles, to himself. We need to be careful not to misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. He is not saying that all people will be saved. He is not saying that. He is saying that all will be drawn. He is saying that all people will now have the opportunity to be saved. We must bear in mind that the Pharisees taught that salvation was for the Hebrews alone and that Greeks and Gentiles could only enter through the back door, if at all. Jesus turns that thinking on its head and says, There is no longer Jew or Greek, slave nor free. Because of the hour of the cross, all people may enter through the main gate, the front door. And Jesus is the main gate. The hour of the cross was the hour of drawing, when not only the people of Israel were offered the gift of atonement, but all the people of the world. All people, not some, but all, would be drawn to Jesus in this hour. One word about the cross, drawing all people to Jesus. Just a sidebar here. Some Christians think they're called to draw people to Christianity or to religion, or to some other worldly enterprise. If you fall in that category, I would warn you that we are not called to lift up a religion, or a philosophy, or a denomination. We are called to lift up Christ and Christ alone, to proclaim Christ and Him crucified. I have found that lifting up religion is a waste of time. Nobody's buying. We shouldn't be selling. Lifting up Jesus. Lifting up Jesus will draw all people to himself. It's far better. Hour, hour. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Hour, hour. The hour of you and me is come. To finish this morning, I think it's important to bear in mind that we are all still living right now in the hour of drawing. We are also living in the hour when Jesus is reconciling everyone with God who wishes to be reconciled. He will do that this very hour. We are also still living right now in the hour of judgment. When our sins have been judged and through the cross we have been redeemed. We are also living right now in the hour of driving out. When the devil's head is crushed under our feet by the power of the cross. Bread and crackers make him flee in terror. Amen. And we are also still living right now in the hour of lifting Jesus up in glory as we live lives that honor him. He is worthy of being lifted up through the highest praise that we can offer. 
And what is that highest praise? Is it songs? Is it offerings? Our lives lived in obedience to Him are the highest praise that we can offer God right now. This is the hour right now when we must lift up our own crosses of self-denial, self-control, and self-sacrifice. He said it must be so. We are to take up our cross daily, and that is how we lift His name up. We lift up Jesus when we carry our own crosses, when we are willing to be that seed that dies to itself, dies to the old things, is made new when God brings us life from death. As Jesus finishes his message at the end of our gospel reading for today, he conveys an overwhelming sense of urgency about this hour. Did you notice? Before he slips away from the crowd, he makes it clear that time is running out. Time is running out. We must work while it is still day, while we have the light of the sun, and before the night inevitably falls. In other words, this hour. This hour is an opportunity that is closing. It may be tomorrow, it may be next week, it may be ten years from now, but Jesus indicates that a time is coming for all of us when it will be too late to choose and he will be hidden from us. Time is coming, certainly at the time of death, but it may come even before that. What will we do? What will we do? Will we commit to follow him more fervently now? I hope that's what we'll do. Or will we let this hour pass? One hour makes a big difference. This is your hour. This is the hour that he has set for you to walk with him, to walk close to him. The right choice is clear. We who believe must embrace this hour and every hour to come for everything it is worth, making the most of every opportunity to walk humbly in forgiveness, to drive out evil, to lift Jesus up, and to draw all people to him. Let us make the most of this hour. Let us redeem the time. Let us walk in the light while we still have the light. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for speaking to us through your word. Thank you for John's gospel and his testimony that challenges us and pushes us, makes us think. More than that, thank you for his testimony that causes us to consider how we might follow you better. Lord, we come to you not really relishing the idea of dying. None of us wants to die, but all of us want to live. Help us to know that to really live means to live in such a way that we seek your honor at whatever cost, even if that means laying our lives down. Lord, for some of us, it may mean actually laying our physical lives down. And Lord, I pray that you would grant us courage if we're approaching that time. But for most of us, Lord, it's little things, like dying to a grudge, dying to an old way of doing things, dying to some stubbornness. Dying to some ruts. Lord, would you help us to die to those things that we need to to bury them so that we can be lifted up anew and that we can flourish as those seeds germinate in the soil of your spirit, of your word. Be with us as we go from here, Father. Help us to have a great time at the celebration party that Randy and Teresa are putting on. Thank you that they're doing that, Lord. But more than having a great time, we want to have a time that honors you. We want to lift you up today. This Would you stand with me for the benediction? May May the grace of our Lord be with you now and always. May you stay blameless till he comes. May the love of our Lord be with you now and always. May you stay blameless till he comes. 
let's clear out of here as quickly as we can and head over to Teresa and Randy's. But not before you see Larry's picture of Levi. Oh my goodness. God bless you this morning. <laughs>